Hey, it's Coach Mo. Hey, it's Coach Mo. Hey, it's Coach Mo. Knowing what you want to accomplish professionally is just the beginning. I'm Coach Mo, and this podcast is for young professionals and emerging leaders who want to lead, achieve, and succeed at work. You've got executive ambitions and the drive to get there. Join me for perspective, insights, and thought-provoking questions that only you can answer. Today's episode starts now. Tuesdays with Coach Mo. Congratulations. You've earned the position as a manager. You posted the great news on LinkedIn, and in the comments, the DMs start pouring in. You have that celebratory dinner with the special people in your life. In fact, you make that new purchase and treat yourself to that special something you've been wanting for a long time. And for the first time in ages, you're actually going off to sleep with a smile on your face, having now realized the significant accomplishment. That's how things actually start out. Until that joyous feeling of a natural high is gone. You know, a few weeks now passing and all of the pleasantries of, hey, welcome to the team. Nice to meet you. So glad you're here. Are now a thing of the past. The current reality is the real just got real. You know, you're headed to work as a first time manager and racing through your mind is, I'm promoted. Now what? You're feeling an immense amount of pride in your achievement, yet I believe that to set yourself apart from others in pursuit of a fulfilling executive ambition is to begin developing your coaching skills now. Why, you may be asking? The complexities of today's large organizations, as in the world, crises appear to be one of the multiple factors forcing organizations to be responsive and nimble to rapid change, stability, and uncertainties. As a result, it's essential that leaders are prepared to cope in this environment while successfully leading others with almost an adaptive leadership capability and having effective coaching skills helps in building and demonstrating this capability. So I first want to clarify what coaching is and isn't, and then focus on the organization's role in your leadership development. And lastly, I'm going to expand on your personal responsibility to your professional pursuits. You know, because the term coaching is so widely used from sports, as in a soccer coach, to entertainment, as in an acting coach, let's clarify the use of the term as it relates to professional coaching for leaders within organizations. Now, the definition as established by the International Coaching Federation states that coaching is actually a partnering with a client in a thought-provoking and creative process that inspires the client to maximize their personal and professional potential. It really is a client-centric service, and it's about the client determining their area of focus and making the most out of how to proceed in pursuing the change that they desire. Professional coaching competencies, as I'm describing, include having trust and safety in the relationship, active listening on the part of the coach, as well as the coach evoking awareness and facilitating the client's growth all of which are vitally important when in the role of a manager. Now, what I propose is that managers know and apply coaching skills for their effective leadership within an organization. Not that every manager needs to become a professional coach. Now, what coaching isn't, it isn't about giving advice or solutions, nor is it about sharing our own personal experience with a particular situation or task. You know, these scenarios are more accurately described as consulting or mentoring. So let me share some examples to distinguish coaching, mentoring, and consulting. So let's imagine a situation that there's a deadline for getting a prototype out to the client. And the deadline has been moved from September 1st to August 1st. So as a new manager using, let's say, consulting skills, which is 
telling the team what to do. They'd say something like this. Because of the change in the schedule, I want you to first contact manufacturing, then contact the sales department, and then third, reach out to the packaging team and learn how this revised schedule is going to impact each of those areas. Now, as a new manager who's using mentoring, which is basically sharing their experience, they'd say something like this. When I faced a similar situation at my last job, I was caught off guard when the IT department couldn't respond to a schedule revision because they were in a system migration. And so lastly, let me explain what it sounds like if a new manager is using coaching skills in this particular scenario with their team. And again, this is about maximizing their potential. A manager may say something like, hmm, You know, let's think this through. What information or resources do you want in order to support your plans with the adjusted schedule? How can we make this happen? So you may be thinking, listeners, to this podcast, hey, wait a minute, but the manager should share their experience with the team to help inform their thinking. And I'd say, yes, you're right. And there is an appropriate time to share that information preferably after the team members have had an opportunity to challenge their thinking and start crafting a strategy, get them thinking for themselves on how they will solve the problem first. Otherwise, as a new manager, if you always jump in first with your experience, you're just simply going to teach them to wait for you to give them your answer. By using coaching skills, I'm showing my trust in their capabilities and supporting them in the process of figuring out how to get that prototype out the door sooner. So for the sake of professional growth for others and for individuals to maximize their capabilities, I believe coaching is the appropriate resource in helping to accomplish these things. Yet here's the thing. Some of you may be sitting there listening to this podcast and thinking, yeah, but Coach Mo." That takes time, helping someone else trying to figure things out on their own. And there's an increased chance that they're going to be making mistakes. And I agree, it does take time. Learning how to coach others is challenging and the rewards are great, which is why it's so important to start early in your leadership journey and develop these skills that will serve you and those who follow you. They'll serve you well. So I encourage you to Take time to understand the distinctions between being an advisor or a consultant, a mentor or a coach. A suggested reference book to support you in the application of coaching skills in the workplace as a first-time manager is the book titled Leader as Coach by PhDs David Peterson and Mary D. Hicks. So what I've witnessed among my clients who've navigated this transition of becoming a first-time manager is a common feeling of being an imposter. They have that imposter syndrome. What am I supposed to say now that I'm the manager? How am I supposed to act now that I'm the manager? How am I supposed to be now that I'm the manager? You see, You are recognized as a star performer while being an individual contributor. And the skills that prepared you for this new role will actually be different skills in order to be successful as a manager. So in the manager role, you're going to find yourself challenged with tackling problems and finding solutions while navigating ambiguity. In an often recognized Harvard Business School article, Becoming the Boss by Linda Hill, She reveals insights of her research studying star performers making the transition to manager. It's here that she makes what I believe a real profound claim. Basically, that there is a void of information related to the experiences of new managers and the challenges that they face. From my position in coaching several first-time managers, I'd agree that the void exists and the playbook is rather thin. It almost appears that the best a new manager can hope for is to have someone in the organization ready to serve as the guide and helper in chief. (laughs) But we all know that is never a sure bet. People are well-intentioned, but things change. Life happens. 
that helper in chief is no longer with the organization or has been reassigned or takes medical leave or has a competing priority in their personal life. What is actually interesting to me about Ms. Hill's findings about this rite of passage and becoming a leader is the misconceptions about this new role. New managers often fail in their new role because of five commonly held misconceptions that result in missteps or neglect of key leadership responsibilities. And I just want to share a couple of those here with you now. One of the misconceptions is that a manager believes that they're to build relationships with individual subordinates. The reality for a manager to be a coach is that they are to coach the individuals and teams so that they collectively and individually fulfill their potential. The next misconception is that the manager feels they should ensure that the operations run smoothly. The reality is, and again, a manager as a coach, is to initiate changes to enhance group performance and strive to maximize the potential of the team. In both reality scenarios, having coaching skills will prepare you for successfully achieving the desired outcome. So let's shift now to exploring that of the organization. And what's their role in your development as a first-time manager? When I read in Gallup's new book, It's the Manager, the research reveals that less than 30% of managers strongly agree with the statement that someone at work encourages my development. I can't help but think that among first-time managers, this number is probably actually significantly smaller. You know, the harsh reality is that no one is going to care more about your development than you. There was a study done that discovered that there is a paltry little 20% productivity improvement as a result of training. However, when training was used in combination with coaching, that productivity number jumped to 88%. So think about it. When people are shuttled through training programs, the hope is that there will be a positive impact on performance or productivity. Quite often in the week or two following the training, If there is no clear follow-up with the participants and how they are applying the new information to that reality of their situation, they're going to default to old habits and ways of getting things done. So with almost $90 billion spent in corporate training programs here in the U.S., why are the collective results so unimpressive? Think about your own experience. You attend a training on managing difficult situations or let's say, emotional intelligence. And what you leave that experience with will be different than the two people next to you. However, if you have an opportunity to be receiving coaching and talk through your insights and new awarenesses and what is most meaningful for you and how you will make applications to your role and team, then you will ultimately get more out of the experience. Now, why is that? Because you're thinking through the relevant possibilities for you and your specific needs. You're taking actions. You're growing from the experience. Some action will be more meaningful than others, and that's okay. And you're sorting through the ups and the downs with your coaching and making the new learning applicable to you. This in turn is like the experience your team and colleagues will benefit from As you apply coaching skills, invite others to think through the possibilities, determine for themselves what will and will not work when they're looking for solutions. The demands of the manager job by design are a challenge. You stand between an organization and its goals and the people to deliver on achieving those goals. So this takes me now to a perspective on the value in gaining self-awareness. Well, gaining self-awareness is hard. This is actually a direct quote I've heard a number of times from my coaching clients over the years. What makes self-awareness so hard, in my opinion, is when you realize the truth about how you show up in the eyes of others and the distorted meaning that has become someone else's reality, it just doesn't feel good. For example, early in my career, my tendency when working with others on a project 
was to speak first with an idea to move a project forward. And I typically would take that a step further and begin suggesting tasks to other members of the team. I didn't think there was anything wrong with my style. I actually thought I was showing leadership by speaking up first. I also thought I was making things easy for everyone by suggesting tasks for them to take on. Well, to say I was shocked is an understatement. Here are some quotes of feedback I received from others early in my career. Well, Monique tends to want to control things. And I worked with Monique on a project, and I felt she was bossy, and she was quick to tell others what to do. (laughs) Wow! I thought to myself, me? Controlling things? Bossy? Well, that feedback just stopped me in my tracks, and it was actually hard to hear. I actually thought I was leading. I never thought I was controlling. How can this be? So why does self-awareness even matter when you're a first-time manager? Well, the expectations you have for yourself are high, and the expectations of others seeing you succeed are also high. And here's the problem. It's a natural tendency to want to deliver on the expectations of the organization, your boss, your peers, your team. And that formula, let's say, hmm, organization plus boss plus peers plus team equals success is actually kind of flawed. (laughs) Why? Because there is an element missing from the equation. The element is you. You get so busy wanting to meet or exceed the external expectations of everyone else that you fail to meet the expectations for yourself. You know, think to yourself, who's the best version of me? What do I want? What do I have to either stop doing or start doing to hone my manager skills so that I can be the best leader I can be? Every aspect of you is uniquely you. In fact, you're like a tapestry of values, strengths, characteristics, personality traits, motivators, beliefs, and on and on. And when you become a manager for the first time, knowing how to make adjustments and shifts to your thought patterns, to your behaviors that are really so natural to you, that becomes difficult. So to effectively apply coaching skills and be committed to getting the best out of others, you must know how to get the best leader out of yourself. You know, eventually, back to uh, the story I was sharing in my personal experience, I actually had the benefit of gaining some self-awareness through the Clifton Strengths Assessment. I soon discovered my dominant talents and how these talents serve me as a strength. And maybe when these same talents got in the way. For example, one of my dominant talents is the theme of activator. So in general, Activators are known for taking action. They want to shift into doing really quickly. They'd rather do than sit around and talk about it. So with time, I came to understand how to adjust that habit of wanting to jump in from the beginning and instead harness my activator talents in a way that was productive for the group. Like the experiences realized by my clients with increased self-awareness, you too can equip yourself to make the shifts necessary to have others experience you as a leader. This means knowing how to shift gears within yourself for the benefit of bringing others along and for the benefit of achieving your goals through, by, and with other people in your professional circle, such as your team, your boss, your peers, even those just throughout the organization. So what this means for first-time managers, by applying coaching skills with your team, you're engaging with them in a way that allows you to earn their trust. How? By knowing how to get your style, talents, and your way of doing things out of the way so that they can learn by considering different possibilities to problem solving and grow from their mistakes while knowing they have a boss who has confidence in them and supports them through their journey. 
Building your coaching skills and getting comfortable coaching others is tough. It takes time and an abundance of patience. And by developing the skill early in your career will likely be a significant contributing skill that moves you closer to your executive ambitions. And now to Coach Mo Knows, a tip, coaching question, and bit of inspiration. So my tip is, if you want to gain awareness of your natural talents and how they serve you as a strength, consider grabbing one of my strength packages that combines the assessment and a coaching session by going to moniquebetty.com backslash strengths. And I'll work with you one-on-one to gain that self-awareness. We'll have that address in the show notes of this episode. And as far as a coaching question, I have a two-part question for you. Part one. Which one coaching skill will you commit to develop now? Developing listening skills, knowing how to ask powerful questions, or learning how to support another person gain focus and motivation in achieving a goal. Part two of my question is by developing this skill, what difference will this make for you? And finally, as an inspiration, this comes from Ray Dalio, who authored Principles. It is a book and an audio book. And his quote is, in short, I learned that being totally truthful, especially about mistakes and weaknesses, led to a rapid rate of improvement and movement toward what I wanted. Make it a great day. This is Tuesdays with Coach Mo. That's a wrap for this episode of Tuesdays with Coach Mo. Showing up here tells me you're willing to invest in yourself and your career. Get additional resources at TuesdaysWithCoachMo.com. Please subscribe and leave a review. I'd love to get your feedback. Till next time, this is Coach Mo signing off. Tuesdays with Coach Mo. 